Unit 2, Forces. In this unit, we're going to examine the forces that cause an object to change its motion. We're going to start with Chapter 3 and discuss Newton's Laws of Motion. 3.1. Types of Forces. A force is defined as a push or a pull on an object. A force can change the shape and or motion of an object. Force is a vector quantity, so expect to see a magnitude and a direction. And the unit of measure is the Newton, named after the grandfather of physics, Sir Isaac Newton. One Newton is equivalent to one kilogram times meters per second square. Basically, a Newton is the amount of force required to accelerate a one kilogram object at a rate of one meter per second squared. And the symbol for force is a capital letter F, and because it's a vector, expect to see an arrowhead on top. When studying forces acting on an object that contribute to an object's motion, we draw free body diagrams. It's a simple drawing of an object showing all the forces that are acting on it. So we're gonna draw a free body diagram of this wagon. And we're going to list all the forces that are acting on this wagon. We can see that this boy on the right hand side is pulling on a rope and that rope is attached to the wagon. On the left hand side we see a young lady that is pushing against the wagon so she's applying a force on it as well. So we'll start by drawing a basic representation of the object in question. In this case it is the wagon. And your free body diagram can be as simple as a square or a rectangle. What you need to do is identify the approximate center of mass for the object with a point. And from that point, we're going to draw all the forces as directed line segments, since they are vectors. And they're all going to be coming from this center of mass that we've identified as this point in the center of the object. Notice I am not drawing the wheels on the wagon. It's not necessary. I'm not drawing the ground that the wagon is resting on. I'm not drawing the boy or the girl. All you have to draw is the object free from its environment. And hence we call it a free body diagram because we are isolating the object free from anything around it. Okay. So let's start with the force that the boy is applying on the object. Now the boy, if you notice closely, is not touching the wagon itself. He's actually pulling on a rope and the rope is attached and applying a force to the wagon. So the force that comes from this boy is called the force of tension. And I'm gonna give it the symbol capital F for force and subscript T for tension. And I'll just label it here. This is the force of tension. Now the girl is also pushing the wagon. She is pushing it to the right, just like the boy. So she is applying a force. And I'm gonna draw the force that she is applying from this center vector as well. Now keep in mind, if she's applying a larger force than the boy, then we'll draw a larger vector. If she's drawing, if she's applying a smaller force than the boy, we'll apply a smaller force or a smaller vector. So I'm going to draw a larger vector. This implies that she is applying a greater force than the force of tension. And I'm going to call it the force applied. And I'm going to give it the symbol F with a subscript A for the applied force. There are some everyday forces, some of which you are very familiar with, and there might be a couple that you may have suspected are there or may have taken for granted, and we're going to identify them for the first time today. The first one is the force of gravity. The force of gravity is the force of attraction between any two objects that have mass. If you've been on your feet all day, a long day at work, then you'll experience the force of gravity that presses down on you continuously because you are near the surface of the earth. 
Next we have the applied force. This is a force that results when one object makes contact with another and pushes or pulls on it. We saw the young lady above in the diagram exerted an applied force onto the wagon. Next is another familiar force, it's the force of tension. This is a pulling force from a rope or a string on an object that always points toward the rope or toward the string. Now the next force is one that I think most of us actually take for granted that it actually exists and it's called the normal force. It's defined as a perpendicular force exerted by a surface on an object in contact with the surface. The normal force always points away from the surface. So this definition doesn't do the best job on explaining what the normal force is and it doesn't really allow us to understand in everyday terms what the normal force is. But I want you for a moment to imagine that the, for the floor that you are resting on has been replaced by a thin sheet of tissue paper. As you would imagine, anything that is resting on the thin sheet of tissue paper would fall straight through it. So if you had a heavy table or chair, the tissue paper would not be able to support those heavy objects. If you are standing on the tissue paper, you will most certainly fall straight through. So what this implies is that when you are standing on the surface of the floor, the floor is supporting you. So as the force of gravity presses you down against the floor, the surface of the floor will counteract this force and apply a force straight up perpendicular to the surface that you're resting on, and this force is called the normal force. I want you to take your hand and press it against either the table that you're writing on or the floor beside you. The harder you press, the harder you can feel the normal force pressing back up onto you. So the normal force, I'm going to read the definition again after we've kind of describe this example. It's a perpendicular force exerted by a surface on an object in contact with the surface. So imagine we had a surface and an object was resting on this surface. The normal force would point straight up or perpendicular 90 degrees to the surface and it always points away from the surface. Now that you think about it, you can't imagine any object resting on any surface without a normal force being present. The last force that we're going to describe, and we're going to actually quantify in a further section, is the force of friction. And this force opposes the sliding of two surfaces across one another. Friction acts opposite to the motion or the attempted motion. So if you're pushing a box to the right, friction is going to oppose that motion and it's going to act to the left, making the box that you're trying to slide more difficult to slide when friction is present. Let's take a moment to look at the force of gravity. To calculate the magnitude of the force of gravity on an object, you must multiply the mass of the object by the acceleration due to gravity. To calculate the force of gravity, you can use the following equation. This equation is the force of gravity is equal to m times g, where g is the acceleration due to gravity that we first were introduced to in the kinematics unit, and g is equivalent to 9.8 meters per second squared down near the surface of the Earth. If you were on a different celestial object, for example, if you were on the moon or a different planet, then the acceleration due to gravity would differ depending on the size or mass of that planet. The force of gravity is measured in newtons and mass is measured in kilograms. And in chapter four, we're gonna examine this even further. Let's take a look at this example, asking us to calculate the force of gravity acting on an elephant with a mass of 1,470 kilograms. Let me see if I can find an elephant emoji. Here we go. 
And I'm going to make it a little bigger. There we go. This elephant is near the surface of the earth, so we can expect the force of gravity to be acting on this elephant. I'm going to draw this force of gravity coming from the approximate center, and we want to calculate this force of gravity. In order to do so, we're going to use our equation. Force of gravity is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. We know the mass of the elephant is 1,470 kilograms, and we know that the that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared down. If you punch this into your calculator, you end up with to two significant digits, 1.4 times 10 to the power of 4 kilograms times meters per second squared. Remember, what you do to the numbers, you do unto the units. So for multiplying the numbers, we're going to multiply the units. We also want to include a direction because gravity is a vector quantity, so all vector quantities have direction. Now, kilogram times meters per second squared is the definition of a newton. So the force of gravity acting on this elephant is 1.4 times 10 to the power of 4 newtons down. Okay. Let's try another example. A large trunk in the basement is pulled by a rope tied to the right-hand side of the trunk by a person, and the trunk does not move. Draw a free body diagram for this trunk. So I'm going to draw a trunk. And this trunk is resting on a surface. And I'm going over these details because I want you to think of what forces are acting on it. Since this trunk is near the surface of the Earth, expect a force of gravity. And this force of gravity is in the downward direction. And I will label it F subscript small g. Now, this trunk is not falling through the ground. And the reason why it's not falling through the ground is because there exists a force that is opposing the force of gravity. Whenever an object rests on a surface, expect there to be a normal force that is perpendicular to the surface. And it's called the normal force. It's opposite in direction, and since this trunk is neither falling through the ground or moving up in the air, we know the magnitude of the normal force is equal to the magnitude of the force of gravity. Next, this question tells us that the trunk is being pulled by a rope tried, tied to the right-hand side by a person. So the person is not touching the trunk, but the rope that he is holding is touching the trunk. So the force that the rope applies is called the force of tension, and it's applied to the right. Now, he's pulling on this trunk, but the trunk will not move. What is keeping this trunk from moving? Well, that is the force of friction. Friction always opposes the motion of an object. And it's always in the opposite direction for the intended motion of the object. So if tension is pointing to the right, then we can expect the force of friction to point to the left. Let me draw that a little bit more parallel. There we go. If he pulls on the trunk with the rope, and the rope does not cause the trunk to move, then that means that the tension was not sufficient to overcome the force of friction on the object. Okay. When several forces act on an object, it's important to be able to calculate the net force, which is 
the same thing as the total force, the total of all forces, more specifically, acting on the object, or the sum of all the forces or the resultant force. All of these are equivalent statements. And we give it the symbol F net. So the net force is defined as the sum of all forces acting on an object. I want you to take a look at this example here, sample problem number two. Our job is to determine the net force acting on this object. There are four forces acting on the object. We have a force of 52 newtons down and a force of 52 newtons up. So these two are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So let's calculate for a second the net force up and down in the up and down direction we have 52 newtons down and 52 newtons up. So what's the sum of the forces acting in the up and down direction? Well, to find the sum, you just add up the forces. So we add up 52 newtons down and 52 newtons up. Whenever you are adding vectors, you should ask yourself two questions. Are they collinear? And are they in the same direction? Remember, we have to make sure that if we're adding them algebraically, they have to be in the same direction. Up and down are collinear, but these two are not in the same direction. So we're gonna change this. We're gonna say 52 Newtons down, and we can either switch them both to down or both to up, it doesn't matter. In this case, I'm switching everything to down. And when you do, you change the sign. So positive 52 Newtons up becomes negative 52 Newtons down. Now we can proceed algebraically, and we see that the upward force and the downward force cancel each other out so that the net force up and down is zero. This implies that the object's motion is not heading up or heading down, that these two forces balance each other out in that direction. Okay, let's find the net force east and west. So we have 62 newtons east and 45 newtons west. These two are collinear. They're both east and west, which is along the same straight line, but they're not in the same direction, so we have to write them both as the same direction. We can either change them both to east or both to west. I hope you can see which one would be easier to change just by trying to get an answer that is positive. I mean, if you got a negative answer, it wouldn't be wrong or incorrect. All you would have to do is change the sign and change the direction. But I can anticipate that if I leave everything as east or change everything to east, so change 45 newtons west to negative 45 newtons east, then I can proceed and add these algebraically and the net force in the east and west direction is 62 newtons east minus 45 newtons east, which is 17 newtons east. Okay, so this example contained four forces acting on the object. This force, this force, the downward force, and the force to the west. These four forces, if you add them up, they are equivalent to one single force of 17 newtons east. If you add the up, the down, the east, and the west, 
we can see that their net force, the total of all of those four forces, is a single force that is 17 newtons east. The up cancels the down, and the 62 and 45 newtons balance out to 17 newtons east. So you can actually take these four forces and replace them with a single force that is 17 newtons because they are equivalent. All right. There are four fundamental forces of the universe. Only four. These are them. Number one, gravity. Gravity is pretty intense. Try to escape gravity and you'll lose every time. Gravity, of all the four fundamental forces in the universe, is the weakest. It's defined as the force of attraction between objects that have mass. For example, the sun exerts a force of attraction onto the earth, and this force keeps the earth in its orbit around the sun. Next we have the strong nuclear force, and this strong nuclear force is what binds atomic nuclei together. And if ever you disrupt the forces that hold the nucleus of an atom together, you know that a ton of energy is liberated. We're talking atomic bomb kind of energy. That's the strong nuclear force that holds these atomic nuclei together. Then we have a weaker nuclear force called the weak nuclear force. And this is the force that's responsible for emitting radioactive nuclei. The fourth force is called the electromagnetic force. And this is the electric force between two charged particles and the magnetic force of moving particles. If you've ever played with magnets, you can see exactly what we're talking about by the force that you experience when magnets either attract or repel each other. This table is probably the most important part of this section where we compare all four of these fundamental forces. And we can see their relative or approximate strength. If gravity is assigned a strength of one, then the strong nuclear force is 10 to the power of 38 times greater than the force of gravity. So we see that gravity st stands apart from all of these forces because it is significantly weaker than the rest of them. Now I want you to take a look at the effect of these forces. The effect of these forces, gravity again stands out because it's the only one that is only an attract force. So you can feel the force of attraction between yourself and the earth because the force of gravity attracts you to an object like the earth. But it's the only one that doesn't have a repel component. All these other forces are capable of attracting and repelling. Now some scientists and physicists actually think that there is so much more we need to learn about gravity. In fact, discoveries are happening as we speak on the nature of gravity and we're learning more and more each day. So maybe there isn't maybe there is more to gravity than we know. Maybe there is an ability for gravity to have a repel effect, but it's one that we're not familiar with yet. I want you to try the homework questions listed below and any corresponding LMS quizzes for this section. Good luck.